Hey guys, welcome back. So today I want to talk to you about Beretta. Beretta is one of the oldest manufacturers of firearms. They've been manufacturing firearms for 500 years. And it's not a public company, it's a privately owned family business. They've been manufacturing firearms for civilians and for militaries worldwide, including the U.S. military. As a matter of fact, in 1985, when Beretta won the M9 service pistol contract, they set up manufacturing facilities here in the United States at Akakeek, Maryland. A lot of people have had a lot of interest about the Akakeek, Maryland facility, including myself, and we had the unique opportunity to go to Akakeek and tour the Beretta factory. Let's get going. The first thing we wanted to do when we got to Beretta was to learn a little bit more about the M9 service pistol. I wanted to learn about its history and how it became America's service pistol in 1985. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the M9 service pistol with uh, regards to the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marine Corps? Sure, the M9 has a very interesting history. Uh, the first time the Beretta started working uh, with the U.S. military on, on pistols goes back to the mid-70s. And at the time there was uh, a t uh, test conducted by the Air Force, it was managed by the Air Force, the JSAP trials. And the pistol, the Beretta 92 at the time it was called the Beretta 92, passed those tests. It then actually passed two more two more government tests. One was the XM9 trials in the mid-80s, and then the XM10 trials in uh, the late 80s. So uh, we call the Beretta M9 the most tested pistol in the U.S. military because it actually not only passed one test, not two, but actually three military tests and won all three. So in 1985, we uh, were awarded the contract for the M9 pistol. Today we've made approximately uh, 600,000, including foreign military sales, of the M9 pistol for the U.S. Uh, Armed Forces. Uh, we've been making the M9 pistol here at the Echo Keek facility since 1987. We employ a workforce of about, about 300 Americans, and we've been uh, making pistols since then. In 2012, we were awarded a, a contract for an additional 100,000 units of M9 pistols. Um, it's an IDIQ contract, so the contract, a five-year contract that can uh, order as many as 100,000. Today, we have about 18,000 delivery orders of that pistol in hand. And relatively recently, the Marine Corps adopted a new M9 pistol, the M9A1. What are the differences between the M9 and the M9A1? The, correct. The U.S. Marine Corps, back in around 2006, uh, they had a requirement for an improved M9. And one of their primary um, needs was the um, accessory rail. Uh, because they needed to attach lights and lasers to the pistol very easily, and the M9 does not have that feature. So they approached Beretta, and we quoted uh, what then became the M9A1, which is primarily an M9 with an accessory rail. There are some other features that came with it. For example, it has a sand-resistant magazine, which we had developed uh, due to the desert wars um, that, that are now expose our pistols to a very, very fine sand. And that fine sand gets everywhere. It gets in any, every system, every, every weapon system, um, and just penetrates inside. And it was penetrating our magazine, and the sand was accumulating there. So by redesigning the magazine, both internally with some geometric changes, and also with a very, very um, high lubricity surface finish, we have improved that magazine's performance in the, in the, sandy, in the sandy dusting environments of the desert. Also, uh, some, a few other changes. We did have a uh, front and back strap checkering on the M9A1, just to improve the grippability, and an improved magazine well bevel, just to make the magazine insertion a little bit easier. Another item in the news recently is that the U.S. Army has announced their intentions to, to perhaps adopt a new service handgun. How does that affect Beretta, and what's your response to that? Well, the U.S. Army, the modular handgun system, the MHS program is ongoing. The Army is asking, basically, industry to uh, provide diff new, newer designs, newer pistol designs, improved uh, pistol designs, and, and also kind of keeping the caliber open at this time. So it's an open caliber competition at this time. Beretta's position, we will obviously participate in MHS, but at the same time our also position, and we've done this already for the past few years, we also believe that the M9 can be improved, just like the U.S. Marine Corps demonstrated, can be improved, and many of the um, Many of the improvements that the Army is asking in the Amadur Hangan system, we can believe can be um, accomplished much, much more uh, cost effectively on an M9 platform. The M9A1 is currently the United States Marine Corps service pistol, and this is the latest version of the handgun. However, the Army has expressed interest in adopting a new handgun to replace the M9. Beretta is proposing the M9A3, which they recently announced. 
So we'll learn in the future whether or not the Army will actually adopt the M9A3 or perhaps another handgun. So we have a lot of ideas, including those that are on our commercial uh, pistol that we sell today that are improvements over the M9. Um, the M9 uh, TDP, the technical data package, is owned by the Army, so they're free to do whatever they want to it. They don't have to ask our opinion, but our point is if they just look at our commercial pistol that we sell today on the dealer, at the dealers, uh, there's many, many characteristics there that they're asking for, which again, in our opinion, could be much more cost effectively introduced rather than spending a lot of money on a new platform that will require new training, new holstering, new technical literature, new logistic supply chains, etc. So something you may consider is to uh, propose the M9 going forward with just some changes, making some changes perhaps to the caliber if necessary, or uh, grip design changes or safety changes, things that the Army is asking for, you may re or re uh, resubmit, I should say, the M9 to those trials? Sure, and we will, uh, that's what we plan to do, uh, whether it's at, uh, during the MHS trials or, or in some other um, form. We believe, yeah, we can address a lot of those uh, issues, even the, even the issue of caliber. Uh, the Beretta 92 platform can be uh, uh, manufactured in 40 caliber. We call it the 96, the Model 96. And so we could introduce a 40 caliber if that's needed. We could work with um, ammunition manufacturers for improved accuracy uh, and improved lethality ammunitions uh, in 9 millimeter. Um, Again, we, could, we believe we can address many, many of the issues that the Army is raising uh, with, with an improved M9 platform. So let's say that the Army adopts the 40 Smith & Wesson. With the M96, obviously it's basically an M9 with a 40 caliber conversion kit. Would you be able to make available retrofit kits that would save the Army money? They could use some of the existing inventory that they have, update them to 40 caliber, and move forward. Yes, we could. We could, take the, uh, we could develop a conversion kit made up of a slide, a barrel, and a magazine that could swap, you could be able to swap an M9 platform, uh, general uh, generic frame, and by swapping those parts, you could convert that pistol to nine millimeter or to 40 caliber use. One of the things that impressed me most about the tour of the factory and taking a look at the M9 pistol and the Model 92s was the amount of hand fitting that went into the handguns. Parts like this barrel were actually hand fit into the handgun. We also noticed that the slides and frames and all the pistols were hand fit by skilled technicians. Another thing that struck me about the tour of the factory was the fact that every single step of the process, there was an incredible amount of testing. Each part was tested pretty much at every stage, and even the tooling used to manufacture the parts is tested regularly. The amount of, of testing and the attention to detail that goes into the construction of these handguns actually took me by surprise. The original components, the raw materials come into this lab that I'm standing in now, and they get tested. And once they're approved, they're sent out for a forging to be made, which I have here in my hands. This forging is then also tested before then it goes out to final finishing. When this is finished, which looks like a complete M9 slide, once this is completed, it comes back in for testing again to test to make sure that the final finish and surface treatments are correct. Then it goes out for the black finish you're all familiar with, and it gets assembled into a complete firearm. In my hand, I'm holding an M9 barrel. These barrels are tested to make sure that they're within specification. Behind me, those tests are being conducted. Now, what happens is they'll take a sample set of barrels from a production lot and make sure that they're within those specifications. Now, if one barrel is out of specification, that entire lot is, is inspected and tested. But regardless of that, each one of these barrels, 100% of them, will be visually inspected. Keeping with old world tradition, every single barrel here at Beretta is hand polished. Both the civilian handguns and the military contract handguns are assembled on the exact same line. I thought that was interesting. The testing between the two is a little bit different. Now this is what I found also to be interesting is the fact that many people automatically assume that if it's a government contract built pistol that it's to a lower standard perhaps than a civilian made pistol. The exact opposite is true. While they're both built on the exact same production line, the military actually has more stringent testing requirements than the civilian side of the house does. Either way, you're getting a very high quality handgun with a surprising number of parts that are hand fit by technicians.
Beretta is of course known for building quality firearms. When you think of the name Beretta, of course you think of firearms. But Beretta is moving into the high technology field and Beretta showcased some stuff that I found to be particularly interesting. These are force multipliers that when used on military service weapons and even in the civilian world will definitely improve the functionality of a fighting rifle. Beretta Defense Technologies, when I came into the facilities today, I saw the shirts and I was unfamiliar with what BDT was. What is Beretta Defense Technologies? Uh, Beretta Defense Technologies is a relatively new uh, initiative at the Beretta Group companies. It is a strategic alliance of four brands, uh, Beretta, Benelli, Sacco and Steiner, that together are able to provide solutions to the defense community in terms of products and services. We are able to take each company's unique and um, very extensive know-how in a particular uh, segment and in the future develop systems from the ground up that will provide additional capabilities to our customers, uh, primarily in the military and law enforcement community. Well, this is an example of how, you know, this is the old way to do it. You take a flashlight, which has its own battery, compartment its own battery, and you put it on a rail. Of course, you're adding weight, because now you have on the other side, you have a laser that has its own battery compartment and its own batteries on the other side. So you keep on adding weight to the, primarily to the front of the gun. Mm -hmm. Now that can become this. Right. So now you have just a simple, uh, an, a simple accessory um, uh, adapter and just a light head. Now and plus the, you get rid of the, the plumbing, the, the wires and all the stuff that's all the wires, snag points. Correct. All yeah. the snag points go away, the weight goes away, the redundancy of batteries goes away, and everything is consolidated in a, in a, in a stock. The stock solution, here's a breadboard to, that demonstrates the concept. Here you have, um, what well, would obviously be hidden in a stock, you have a battery pack. The Army is favoring standard AA batteries for, for simplified logistics around the world. Mm -hmm. They can be found anywhere. This can be as high tech as a chargeable lithium ions, but again, the Army right now wants simple AA batteries. And you power, you power a rail that can transfer not only power to and from the rail, but also data. So now I can transfer um, uh, a video image, uh, laser range finder, uh, ranging information. Uh, I can transfer data uh, back and forth and power back and forth. I can apply a control panel anywhere I want on the rail. I can put that anywhere I want where it's ergonomically uh, comfortable. And I can program the buttons to do several things. In this case, that button obviously is activating the, the uh, light. This next button can activate a laser. The next button, a laser rangefinder, etc. By doing this, I'm removing, uh, again, the bulk and the weight of redundant battery systems and battery compartments and simplifying control. So under stress now, the soldier only has four consolidated buttons or three consolidated buttons to think about and not remember, okay, I gotta turn this lever, push that button, do this and that. It's all under uh, at his fingertips. One concern is redundancy of, of batteries. Um, again, because it's new technology, people obviously are, are, are nervous about that because they are not, since it's a yet to be proven technology, they're concerned, well, what happens if this battery pack fails? Well, our answer to that is, again, until the technology is proven to their satisfaction, we can supply redundant power systems. For example, we could have a battery pack that's carried by the soldier that can be clap, clamped onto any part of the rail and will provide instantaneous uh, emergency backup power. About three years ago, Beretta announced at SHOT Show they would be introducing the ARX100, which is a semi-automatic version of the ARX160, which is currently the Italian military service rifle. When they announced the gun, there was quite a bit of excitement about it at the shows, and people were giving Beretta a hard time because he fell behind on their delivery schedule a little bit and bringing it to the U.S. civilian market. When the gun arrived, it seemed as though some of the excitement petered out, but I was still pretty excited to get my hands on the rifle. Now, in the U.S. market, the AR-15 is the rifle to beat. And how this rifle compares to the AR-15, well, that's really tough. It really appeals to a different market. This was designed from the ground up to meet the military needs of the Italian armed forces. So when I started looking at the gun, that's the perspective that I took when I was evaluating the rifle. And from looking at it in that light, I came to conclude that the rifle really has some pretty unique features and from an engineering standpoint is actually quite ingenious. Internally, I found the engineering of the ARX100 to be intriguing. Taking a look at the bolt, this is where I found probably one of the most interesting features. 
On the face of the bolt, we have two extractors and two ejectors. When you switch the rifle from left to right hand ejection, you're simply moving a cross block pin, which is a very simple mechanism, either left or right, which then allows you to use one side or the other as the ejector or the extractor. In essence, this is giving you two extractors and two ejectors. If one extractor should fail with the tip of a bullet, you can make the weapon operational again. It's rather ingenious and the whole system is extremely simple in design. Another thing that I found to be interesting about the rifle was just how quickly and easily you could remove the barrel from the rifle. And not only does the barrel come out for easy cleaning and replacement, but when you put the barrel back in the gun, it actually does maintain zero. Now I will admit that the rifle isn't a sub MOA rifle, but most military rifles aren't intended to be. As a matter of fact, the USM4 is expected to hold about three MOA at 100 yards with military ball ammunition, and the ARX100 easily meets those specifications. I have found the rifle to be extremely well made, very durable, very reliable, and easy to maintain. I also like the fact that the gun that I'm holding here, the civilian version, is 100% made in the United States. Everything from the cold hammer forged barrel to the injection molded polymer body, it's all made here in the United States, and we get a chance to take a look at that, of course, when we toured the Beretta factory. The traditional way to make a barrel in the United States has been to take a barrel blank and pull a cutting tool through the barrel that would then cut the rifling into the barrel. Some would argue, I would argue, that the best way to make a barrel is to hammer forge it. This process is nothing new, it's been used in Europe for a long time, but the process is just now starting to make its way into the United States. What I have in my hands right now is a barrel blank. This is the beginning of what will become an ARX100 barrel. It has no rifling, and as you can see it's relatively short and thick. This barrel blank is placed in that machine, which is the hammer forge, and what comes out is a rough barrel that looks like this. Next, they'll take the rough barrel, which I have in my hands, and they'll put it in this machine. This machine will put a rough contour on the barrel, and what comes out looks like almost a completed ARX100 barrel, but there's still a little bit more to be done to it. The last step in making an ARX100 barrel is to cut the shoulder, get it perfectly dimensioned, because again, this is where the barrel head space is on the rifle, and also to machine this diameter here, which is around the chamber area, which is a critical fit where it locks into the quick change barrel system of the rifle. And then the last step is cutting or contouring the barrel here, which is where the gas block sets on the barrel. The barrel is one small component of the total ARX100 package. At the Akakik facilities, Beretta manufactures all the components and assembles them into the new complete rifle. The ARX100 has its own dedicated assembly area where technicians conduct final assembly before the rifles are sent out for quality assurance and test firing. Here's something I found to be really interesting. Every single rifle is taken to a test fire area where it's not only tested for reliable function with standard commercial ball ammunition, but every rifle is also tested with a proof load. A proof load is loaded above normal operating pressures. This is done to assure the quality and integrity of the barrel. I've never seen such tests conducted on every firearm before, and I believe this speaks volumes to Beretta's commitment to quality and to testing. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed taking a tour of the Beretta factory. It was a unique opportunity for us. We really enjoyed it. And I learned quite a bit about the manufacturing of Beretta firearms. If you guys have any questions about anything you've seen in this video, you can ask those questions on our Facebook page. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash military arms. Also, please swing by and check us out on Instagram. And I invite you guys also to come by and check out our online store at Copper Custom Armament. And that domain is coppercustom.com. Again, everybody, thanks for watching. We'll talk to you guys soon.